Hello, welcome again to the episode of the Let People Prosper series. My name is Dr. Vance Ginn. I hope you're having a prosperous day. Well, today is June 15th, 2023, and I'm delighted to have someone who is on the front lines of the discussion about COVID-19, what the responses should be or not be, and just the discussion overall and continued since then. And it's none other than Dr. Jay Batachara. Jay, welcome to the Let People Prosper show. Thank you for having me on, Vance. It's an honor to be with you. Well, it's a really an honor for me. It's an honor of mine, and um, I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. I think the audience will learn a lot from it and hopefully help us to learn of what not to do <laughs> and to do maybe in, in the future whenever this may happen. But before we get into all that, let me go ahead and read your bio for the audience just so they'll know um, who you are and where, where you're coming from. So Jay is a professor of medicine at Stanford University. He is a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and at the Stanford Freeman Spogley Institute. He holds courtesy appointments as professor in economics and in health research and policy. He directs the Stanford Center on the De Demography of a Health and Aging. His research focuses on the economics of healthcare around the world with a particular emphasis on the health and well-being of vulnerable populations. He, his, he has peer-reviewed research um, in multiple journals in economics, statistics, legal, medical, public health, and health policy journals. He holds an MD and PhD in economics from Stanford University. So all around, just a great guy. And you're you're active on Twitter. Um, that's where I've followed you and got connected you with the most there. But there's always a lot of good information that you're putting out. And so I'm really delighted to have you on. Before we get started in some of that, though, I'd like to give the audience a background of, you know, who you are and, and why you do what you do. So, so Jay, what why do you do what you do each and every day? I mean, I, I always wanted to be a doctor. Uh, I sort of discovered economics while I was uh, going through undergrad. I realized that that it was actually quite a powerful tool for thinking about, about health. I've, and the other thing, I, I was born in India, came to the U.S. when I was four. I have seen, um, like my mom grew up in a Calcutta slum, right? I've seen what the effects of poverty are firsthand, uh, but, but visiting, you know, relatives in India. For me, the, the, but like the, the main thrust of my work throughout my career, my, my adult life, has been trying to understand how constraints, economic constraints, constraints posed by government regulations and, and, uh, and other, other constraints, informational constraints and so on, what impact it has on the lives of the poor and the vulnerable of the world. I, I, and, I, and all my work is aimed at better understanding that and then de helping develop policies so that we don't make the lives of the poor worse. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think it fits right into the work that I'm doing and let people prosper is kind of my mantra that I've used a lot and made it my podcast you know, um, title. It, and it really is important. I mean, I also grew up from a pretty low income area of Houston, uh, maybe not quite the, the same there, but you you see people struggle so much. And part of that is economics and respons personal responsibility. There's a lot of different factors that go in. And what we don't want to see is that government's forcing us in the wrong direction, <laughs> you know? And um, and so you've, you've really got into not only the economics, but also as a, as a medical doctor, how has your career been as a, as a medical doctor? What do you mostly focus on there? Well, so I, I teach in, in a school of medicine. And my, now I'm in the Department of Health Policy. I was in the Department of Medicine for a very long time. But I don't I don't see patients. I do okay. research full time. I mean, I, okay. uh, I, I because of my PhD in economics, I know a, a fair bit about, uh, you know, quantitative methods and statistical methods. And I applied them to asking a whole range of questions through my career, uh, both in developing and developed countries on how health, uh, you know, a, a very, a whole bunch of various aspects of health. I mean, basically, if there's a interesting question having to do with data analysis uh, I, I would uh, I'd, be, I'd be I'd be very happy to look into it during the pandemic I focused a lot on the policies that we followed the the, the lockdown policies trying to assess not, not just whether they were effective in stopping the Z spread it turns out they're not particularly effective but also uh, and uh, but, but also on how widespread the disease really is and then also uh, finally on what impact have they had the collateral harms have they had on the poor, the vulnerable, on children, on the working class people. And the picture it paints, uh, Vance, is, is, is not a flattering one for the policies that we followed. I, I believe that what we've done during the pandemic is, is among the very biggest public health catastrophes in history, certainly in peacetime. Um, and it could have been avoided had we thought more carefully about the trade-offs and the, and, the, and, and the the actual lived experiences and lives of people that these policies affected, rather than some ivory tower models that look at uh, you know sort of you know, if uh, you know basically like Sim City like models like where you play a video game you keep people apart and the disease stops spreading. The life isn't actually like that, and unfortunately, a lot of the the thinking in the pandemic 
was was informed by very very naive social science models and epidemiological models. And so I've been I've been trying to throughout the pandemic tell people about the limitations of those models and uh, highlight the harms that are being done to the to to, to the poor, to children, and the working class. Yeah, no, it, it's great, and and you're on the front lines of doing that, and you have been for a while. So I appreciate all that you're doing, and you know it, that doesn't come without risks. There, there's been a lot of pushback uh, from the work that you've done over time. Un unfortunately, as you're trying to outline what some of the key costs are, I mean, that is what economics is all about, is the scarcity, the trade-offs that are out there, the unintended consequences of the actions that are taken by people and ultimately with policymakers with their limited knowledge, you know, the Hayek's knowledge problem. And, and I think when we, when we go back and reassess what happened, I think that there were a number of failures, to your point, and the, the consequences have been ca catastrophic. You know, one the one just recent tweet that you've had here recently, which I, I, I will put in the show notes page and hope others will go and check it out. But it's on a, a paper by Kevin Bordosh or Bordosh. Yeah. Uh, How did the COVID pandemic response harm society? A global evaluation and state of knowledge review. And, and you provide a great overview. And there's even a nice chart here, I guess, figure two, which goes through like each one of the areas, health, economy, income, education, food security, governance, environment. I mean, there are just tons of costly effects, the side effects of the actions that were taken at that time. And, you know, looking at it, I want to dig into that some more. But just thinking about the time of the pandemic, I mean, the economy was flourishing. Um, I was there from in the, in the White House as chief economist of the Office of Management and Budget from June 2019 to May of 2020. So the economy was flourishing. Unemployment rates were low. Poverty rates were the lowest on records. Real median household income was the highest on records. I mean, there was a lot of good things that were going on. And when this started to happen and we saw the spread of the virus, you know, the COVID-19 and the pandemic started in, in other countries and we started to see it in the United States as well. There was more discussion that was taking place in the White House, um, in the Situation Room. I found myself a couple of times, you know, talking to folks, and there was a lot of discussion about the uncertainty that was going to happen. How do you forecast where this is going to spread? To your point about the epidemiologist sort of models, and I was like, look, this this stuff is. There's no way they're going to be able to do this with the models that they have. And if we come down to a situation where we're going to shut down the economy in some capacity, um, it's not going to work. That's not how behavior, human action works. And, and we're going to have some some substantial cost. And um, unfortunately, though, you did have those um, like Fauci and Burks and others who took a different path. I'm not sure that they looked at the unintended consequences from an economic angle like we might. And so there was a whole different direction that was taken. But I wonder from you on the outside, as you were looking at this, what 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 were you thinking at the time? Well, I, I had a couple of thoughts. So so first of all, uh, in early uh, early March or mid March, I wrote an op ed in the Wall Street Journal because I'd been looking at the the data out of China, the this Diamond Princess cruise data, and so on, and uh, it was really clear that the virus was more widespread than we realized. And I remembered back to the H one N one swine flu days, where I mean, it, it it was basically the same mistake. Like we thought that the virus was was sort of contained, uh, and and, the, and that meant that the the, the uh, infection fatality rate was really high because you know it, it, a very few people uh, got it, and a lot of people were dying. But it turned out in the H one N one days and swine flu days that when people did studies of how widespread the virus actually was by looking at antibodies in the population, they found that. It was, you know, 100 or 200 people had already been infected that people didn't know anything about per case. So I had that same idea that in this pandemic, I thought, well, maybe the virus is already more widespread than we realized in mid-March. I wrote an op-ed and I did a study in Santa Clara County and another one in LA County, another one with Major League Baseball. And we found that that was actually the case. There's 40 or 50 more per, uh, infections per case that had been identified to date. And that meant the infection fatality rate was two out of a thousand, not the three out of a hundred that, uh, that the World Health Organization was saying at the time. At the same time, I was also thinking about exactly what you said, Vin. The, the collateral harms from this was were likely to be tremendous. It was really, really clear to me that uh, if we engaged in these kinds of social distancing, lockdown policies, that it was really only a privileged class of people that could comply and thrive in it, right? It would be it would be the laptop class, the people uh, like there was a study in the NBER that uh, that found that oh, I think about thirty six percent or thirty seven percent of people uh, in the United States have jobs that could be replaced by work from home. Well, that meant sixty three percent don't, right? And, and I knew the number of that was much higher in the rest of the world. And you know, we globalized our economies the last 40 years. We we what that meant is that you know we have these trade relations. A lot of poor countries reorganize their economies to 
fit into the global economy. Their job structure, jo job market structure changed in order to fit in. Uh, a billion people were lifted out of poverty over the last 40 years as a consequence of that. My, my, the, the, uh, like we started with this discussion with India, India has gotten vastly richer as a consequence of this over the last 40 years. The uh, the effect of the lockdown essentially was to renege on those promises. And I could see that the pointy end of the lockdown was gonna be some guy in, in, in a poor country who makes a, a, a living, you know, barely makes a living, loses his job, forced into dire poverty. That that was coming. I could see that from the lock from the, from the scope of the lockdowns. And um, you know, I wasn't alone. The the UN World Food Program was projecting in I think April or May 2020 that there would be 130 million additional people at di in dire food insecurity, meaning basically starvation. And uh, and the World Bank was saying 100 million additional people. In, in dire poverty, meaning two dollars a day or less of income. Those both those were the thoughts in my head at, in March of 2020 that I could see that that we were misunderstanding the epidemiology of the disease and that we were not talking about the obvious collateral harms that are going to happen to the poor of the world. Yeah, it was it was really sad. And, and one of the things that I also took heart of is the the idea of the entrepreneur, right, in in the marketplace. And when you shut down businesses, you're shutting down the entrepreneurial spirit that could have come up with better ways to deal with this. I mean, you know, the plexiglass between each other, if we needed that earlier on or something else. But if you if you basically shut everybody down, you're saying that the only game in town is really the government. And and we know the government doesn't do things well. I mean, basically it took ROMB staff and, and, and used them to help with the distribution of the PPE because that wasn't being done properly. And, and that still took some time. And I mean, I think, you know, Operation Warp Speed, there were some benefits to that and, and things of that nature. But but my guess is, is that things would have been a lot faster had we let market signals and prices allocate resources be better than government. Uh, but what say you? I mean, I, I, do, I do agree that there's a lot to that. I mean, I think I think a lot. It was interesting to watch the the uh, businesses in the in the United States and elsewhere adjust themselves to the demands of the pandemic. And a lot of it was like absolutely entrepreneurial and uh, and, and actually more than that, altruistic almost. Uh, although, although, you know, there was some profit made. The, the, the idea was, I mean, I saw, for instance, like there was a move to produce ventilators, right? At mass scale, as soon as people understood that the, 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 the message got out that the ventilators were in short supply, right? That was a, that was a private thing. A lot of the uh, uh, huge firms shifted uh, and, and and small businesses shifted what they did you know it's like uh just at a small scale people started making masks at scale you know at, at, at uh you know and, and selling them to, to to their or 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 just giving them away to their neighbors the the uh, the, the industry of of zoom for instance and online uh replacements for work and school that i mean it basically developed overnight uh, so i i think there's like i think you're absolutely right that the that the the market responded very, very effectively to the signal that it was getting. The problem though, I think, was that the market signal that it was that it was getting was was not a signal that was like that was actually, I mean, not necessarily productive, right? So like, I mean, I, I think I I think Operation Warp Speed was a good idea. So like revamping what pharmaceutical companies did to focus on developing vaccines was a really, really good idea. But like the ventilators turned out to not be such a great idea. I mean, it wasn't wasn't as necessary as we thought. Uh, the the masks at scale, the plastic barriers at scale, the all of the stuff. These were signals that were sent by governments to markets, and of course, markets respond. That's what they do. The issue is like, are they are they doing the right thing? And the question that answer the answer to that question is not not always. It depends on whether the signal being sent is correct. And here you saw a massive government intervention changing what markets did. Yes, yeah, that, that's right. Um, it, it, it's quite fascinating to see what happened, what the effects of that were, and and how long things were shut down. I mean, I think you know we had what was it the thirteen days or fourteen days the to stop the spread, and then that ended up being in in many places, you know, months, um, essentially, where things were shut down. Maybe not the same level, even in Texas where I live. You know, it wasn't until the spring of 2021 where things were fully open again. Things opened up, I think, faster than some other states in Texas compared to other states. But but still, there was a lot of businesses that couldn't op open up 100. percent You had the other um, limitations of how many people could be in a facility because they have the the three feet, you know, or the, the however much room you needed between each person for the isolation part of it. There was just so much that had changed over such a short period of time that 
also not only influences the business owners and there was, you know, there was the uh, paycheck protection program that came out to help some keep people keep their, their employees. Um, but there was also a disconnection of, of work and the, the dignity and respect that comes from work over that period of time to where many of them just decided to drop out entirely, which changed a lot of the dynamics of the economy, of the labor market. And, and I think that we're still feeling the repercussions of some of that. Um, have you looked into some of that as well with your research? I have, yeah. So I, I mean, I, what I think um, the key idea I have here is that is that. Uh, so let me just do a little bit of history about how how economists thought about those kinds of restrictions early Please. on. Um, there, there were there were some economists that were arguing that that these that people were so scared about the virus that they were going to take actions even even apart from formal government government uh, government action, government uh, controls on you know lockdowns, orders shut down businesses, and so on. And I think that's true, right? I think people were scared, and they did take actions in their lives to to res restrict the amount of spread. Uh, restrict restrict their their interactions with other people, right? So the economists then concluded that these because people were scared and would have taken action anyways, the marginal harm from the formal action to shut down businesses, schools, and so on was zero, mm. right? Because the uh, people would have done those same things anyways. What what, what it's so like you having the government tell you to do that didn't matter. I, I think there's two problems with that argument. First. The, the the fear itself was a policy choice, right? You had a, de a decision essentially made by government to say to the public that this is this is a so catastrophically problematic that you have to like you have to hide, you have to make sure your children don't go to school, you have to, you have to do everything you can to don't visit grandma, whatever it is, right? It's so important that you must stop everything in your life and focus your all your attention on simply avoiding a single virus for years, right? That kind of fear mongering, augmented by media highlighting the harms of COVID, but not highlighting the harms of the, the lockdown pandemic response, that was a policy choice. That wasn't just an endogenous thing that happened. Right. So, yeah. so I think it's it's problematic to say, okay, well, people would have done this anyways, when the people are, cha are responding to the fear. The second thing is, how does how do you know for a fact that people would have closed their businesses, would have not sent their kids to school just simply out of uh, organic fear? I think that's false. And I think economists just got this, a lot of economists, not you, Vance, but like a lot of economists got this wrong early in the pandemic, where, where they would they, they, they would look at this and say, well, the marginal harm must be zero because of the fear. But like the specific actions that people took were in response to specific regulations imposed by the government on those actions. And many of those made no sense, like the plastic barriers, it turns out, actually probably spread the disease more because it reduced airflow. Uh, the, the three or six feet social distancing, not based on any science at all, especially since it's aerosol spread. You could be 60 feet away or 100 feet away, 10,000 feet away. You just happen to like be in the same room where someone once upon a time was a couple hours ago and the virus, uh, you get it from them, even though they're not in the same room. So they could be miles away. Um, so the distancing, all of these measures, these responses to the virus were, were premised on sort of very, very shaky science. And the economics of it were were, were, were based on on these faulty signals being sent by scientists, uh, magnified by uh, by media, and then government governments taking actions, uh, essentially not respecting the kind of private information you're talking about. No, uh, it's a great point there. Yeah, I mean, there what that that fear, that unexpected action of what's going to happen in the future. I mean, you saw that. I saw that in my family. I saw that in friends. Unfortunately. In some cases, not necessarily with me, but I know other family members have stopped talking because of what happened during this, whether they wanted to mask up or not mask up, or, you know, there was a, just so much um, tension during that time that I think is still bleeding over into the rest of, of society and, and maybe some isolation that's going on. But but you're right, these unintended consequences and, and going back to a, another term, precautionary principle, is basically we need to act today so that we can forego some of the risk that's in the future. The, the, but the but the problem with that, and it's usually talked about with climate change or global warming and how we need to act today, but I kind of saw that happening within this area as well, because if we can shut things down, which I don't think we should ever do that again, I don't think we should have done it then, what, what precedent does that set for us to do something else if it is climate change, if, if they push it on us and say, look, this is a dire situation, we've got to shut things down to stop you know, carbon emissions and everything else. I don't, I don't know that they wouldn't try to do that again or, or the next thing. And, and so I'm, I'm really concerned about what that will create because of the psychological effects, unless 
we can get more of these research and ideas that you're working on and others and I've been worked on in the past, get these out there. Um, but I, I wonder what some of your thoughts are on that. So Vince, I think I think so there's a couple of things. So one is um I, I actually think that we should we should be um, we should embrace the precaution principle, but we should yeah. do it in a very rigorous way. Yeah. Right. So so uh so for instance, um in this pandemic, people justify the lockdowns on the on the precautionary principle, but it was a very inadequate application of the precautionary principle, right? So you have a, an uncertain risk about the world. Like in this in this case, it was a, a what's this virus? What's it going to do? Who does who's it going to affect? So on and so forth, right? Put yourself in March 2020. You mentioned uncertainty in the Situation Room. I mean, that is that's. That is normal. That's not what decision making is about. All right. So in that situation, what does a precautionary principle buy you? It says, well, there are people who put the thought about this and have given you the worst case scenarios. They've given you some probabilities associated with them. They've they they they've given you the worst things that could happen. Fine. I don't know for certain if those worst things are going to happen. Probably not likely that the worst things are going to happen, but maybe, maybe. Uh, the precautionary principle says, okay, let's accept the worst case scenario for the thing that, that that's, that's going to happen. Well, now, now the actual work begins. You still have to do the cost-benefit analysis, right? You still have to say, the, are the actions I'm taking, is it going to mitigate those, 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 those worst case? How, to, to what is the probability that, that, that the actions I'm taking will actually work to mitigate the thing I'm taking? What are the harms of the actions I'm taking? On, and, it's, and you can't just do this in general. It's for every single action you're taking, you still have to apply the, the 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 standard principles of cost benefit analysis when the precautionary principle is in play. All the precautionary principle buys you is the accepting of the of something like the worst case in your planning. It doesn't obviate the need to do the 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 careful planning and to apply cost benefit analysis to that to that. So I think that's that's first on the on the like the government uh, like how um, on a policy scale like you can't just use the precautionary. I think the way I saw it used was. Oh well, the, the the this is a very bad virus. Therefore, we should close the world down. Right. No, that skips a step. Mm -hmm. It's a very bad virus, absolutely. But then the question is, what should we do about it? That's a that is a that is not obvious from the precaution principle by itself. What one should do about it? Yeah. Uh, the second thing about the precaution principle, and this is this is I think underappreciated. The precautionary principle, when applied to your own life, may lead you to actions that are individually beneficial, but are actually socially harmful. And we saw this here during the pandemic, right? So shutting down our economy one person at a time might be individually reasonable, right? I want to stay home and stay safe. I'm gonna not uh, go out and open, open a, 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 the small business I was thinking about or whatever it is, right? But the social consequence of that, of this, or or maybe maybe something very small. I'm not going to go to church anymore. I'm not going to I'm not going to go uh, volunteer in my kid's school anymore. In fact, I'm going to pull my kid back from school. The social consequence of that is actually quite negative from a precautionary principle point of view, right? You end up with a situation where a lot of people get harmed. Like we were just talking about the poor, the poorest of the world getting harmed based on decisions made by, in, in, maybe even individually optimal decisions made by by Western countries. It's like the opposite of the the invisible hand principle of of, of Adam Smith. And invisible hand, the, the, the idea is that your actions in a uh, through price signals sent in a market, uh, even though you're not intending to do to to like sort of optimize human welfare, has often has that effect as long as there aren't externalities and so on and so forth. Right? It, it's like your your the the price the the individual action has a socially beneficial effect in a in a market setting that when in a well well functioning market. Here you have the precautionary principle operating the opposite way, where the individually optimal thing in this like very distorted realm ends up because of because of distortions of the science, because of distortions of fear mongering, and so on, end up doing much social harm. Yes. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And that's a great point um, there as well. Give us something to think about and for the audience. The last thing I'd really like for our few minutes we have left together is to think about the the costs. I mean, one of the things I think the Folks who would talk about the shutdowns as being a good thing would say, but look, we saved so many lives. You know, there was the initial reports that were coming out, I think, by Neil Ferguson saying two million plus deaths. And that really got a lot of the scare, fear mongering that was going on at the time. And, and then you look at the excess deaths, you look at other areas of health that weren't able to go to the doctor for cancer screenings, for cardiac screenings, you know, other things that were going on, liver screenings, those sort of effects as well. What, what is kind of your research and your look at the data? Do we have a good idea of like how many people have, 
you know, actually died from COVID versus, and, and then, you know, what are the excess deaths otherwise, given the shutdowns and everything else? I, I, mean, I think a lot of people have died from COVID. There's no question yeah. about that. I mean, certainly over a million, I think, in the U.S. Now, the question, though, is how many of those were preventable? And the question, though, is, is the actions that we took, what, what collateral harms happened? For this, uh, there's a fantastic new book put out by a, a group led by Steve Hankey at, the, at, uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins. And what they've done is they've looked very carefully at this detailed literature, because you know here you're answering a counterfactual question, right? What what if? What would have happened if? And the and the way that social scientists and I'm, I'm talking to you as a, as a social scientist, so you all know, is we 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 compare places that did one thing and did another thing, and then we fight over are these are these like actually good at comparisons? Because we, we often can't do randomized trials. And there's a lot of sophisticated econometric methods to try to de-bias uh, when in these situations where you're comparing, right? When they looked at the, the the vast set of studies that were done to see how many lives were saved by the lockdowns in the United States in 2020, their conclusion is that the that the that the literature is saying very very few. So the early lockdowns did almost uh, almost nothing to save lives. Uh, and their estimate is something like 4,000 lives saved by the lockdowns in the U.S. And the the reasoning is that. At best, what the lockdowns did is it pushed off into the future by a few months what, when you got the disease. It didn't actually result in, um, in not your, preventing you from getting the disease altogether. Now, that could be beneficial, right? So if you push it off until there's like better treatments and vaccines, that's fine. But, the, but when you do the math, it turns out to be 4,000 people in the U.S., maybe 6,000 in Europe. And then you have to compare that against the harms of the of the lockdowns. And, and let's just focus on health harms. You mentioned one, which is really important, which is people skipped cancer screening in large numbers. Some estimates are in Europe that a million people delayed their diagnosis of cancer. That means that there are women that are gonna die today as a consequence of late stage breast cancer that should have been picked up in 2020 in early stage. Would have, they would have survived it. You have people dying at home of untreated heart attacks, Heart attacks, if you're having one, is not are not worse, for, are not better for you than COVID. People were so scared of COVID, they didn't go to the hospital in 2020, dying of heart attacks. Uh, there, 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 there are. Um, we we told people to stay home, and essentially lead an unhealthy lifestyle. Don't go out. Don't exercise. Your your neighbors are dangerous. Don't don't socialize. We have a pandemic of isolation. Huge numbers of older people died of of loneliness in the pandemic, especially in in in, in nursing homes and care home settings. So, you, you know, it was incredibly short-sighted, even from a, just a health point of view. The numbers there are catastrophic. And if you look, for instance, at, like at the, if it just, just death, all-cause excess deaths in Sweden are lower than almost the whole of the rest of Europe and vastly lower than the United States. And they didn't lock down. They didn't panic their population. I mean, they did sensible things like trying to protect their older population. I mean, I think early on they didn't do so well in Stockholm and nursing homes, but, but after they, after they, after, after like say March 2020, they self-corrected, and they they gave their population tools for how to protect the most vulnerable, uh, and, and while at the same time not panicking the rest of the population. They never closed schools for kids under 16 ever, and only for high school kids for very short times. They apologized for closing colleges. So I, I think I think if you're doing the math on this, the the pandemic management just turns out to be a catastrophic failure. It didn't protect very many people in the United States, uh, and, and, and it and it and it led to a huge amount of harm uh, in terms of the health of, of Americans. Yeah. No, that's right. And um, the book is, is this the one, uh, Did Lockdowns Work? The Verdict on COVID Restrictions? That's the one, yep. Okay, I'll make sure to put that in the show notes page. Um, that just came out June 2023. I want to make sure I read that. And, um, you know, so, so wrapping up here, I think this is the, the most important part that hopefully we'll learn the lessons from because of those unintended consequences, because of the deaths and everything else. And one of the things that I'm concerned about as well is the the long-term effects of this, not only those who didn't get the screenings, I mean, that's unfortunate, that's catastrophic in and of itself, but also the kids that were locked, you know, basically couldn't go to school. There's kids, the schools were shut down. Um, now I'm a big fan of school choice. So I think that has contributed to the school choice revolution, which is great. But unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of learning loss that has happened that that already had has happened and, and will take time for many of those kids to regain. And, and as we know, as economists, that that's you know, that's learning loss, that's income loss, that's that it, it's a it's a catastrophic event also for them 
moving forward, um, along with the loneliness, uh, maybe some kids not learning how to speak correctly early on because they didn't see the the mouths of the teachers or someone else. I think that is also going to be a, a large factor of productivity losses. I need, I hate to talk about things in economic terms, but they're, they're, these are all going to influence people's lives moving forward, right? I mean, so if you look at, there's a there's an estimate by uh, uh, one of my colleagues um, here, at, here at Stanford, Rick Hanischek, who estimated mm -hmm. that we cost our kids like $16 trillion or something, some crazy number over their lifetime. Uh, but you know, it's not just money. It, there's a there's a health economics literature that precedes the pandemic, which showed that small, even short, short periods of skipping school, uh, you know, the way they do this is they'd say, look at one state that they have a, has a compulsory schooling law at age 16 that raises it to uh, from 15 to 16 and compared to neighboring state and uh, see what happens to those kids in those two states in, over a lifetime. Those short periods of skipping school have health consequences. Kids that are deprived of an education for even short periods of time, uh, are, they're of course poorer, but they also lead less healthy, shorter lives. One estimate by the editor of JAMA Pediatrics in 2020 was uh, found that what we cost our kids just from the spring lockdowns alone, five and a half million life years. I mean, just think about how short-sighted the, the investments we make in our kids in schooling are among the very best investments we, we can make as a society, that we do make as a society, hugely beneficial. And we decided for essentially for two years that in many, many places that they, that just wasn't essential. It was incredibly short-sighted. And it wasn't even, it was so unequal too, right? So you have, you know, like reports out of New York City of like, of rich parents, uh, hiring school teachers who who weren't in school because the, their their schools were closed to teach their kids in pods for you know tens of thousands of dollars, and whereas families of poor poor kids and poor families had no opportunity for that, huge yeah. learning loss there. I mean, actually, this speaks to why the lockdowns failed. By the way, our societies are tremendously unequal, mm -hmm. and not everybody can afford to to lock down. And of course, the, the, you know, if you have to feed your family, you're going to do that. And how do you correct it? I don't know the answer to that, Vince. I don't know the answer to that. It's one of these things where like uh, a lot of critical periods in kids' lives have been interrupted over the last two years in, in, in pan because of this panic mongering. And by contrast, if you look in Sweden, didn't close schools, they had no learning loss. Wow, that's that's something else. You know, and, and to your point, just exacerbating the issue of the inequality. And there's a lot of talk about income inequality and other types of inequalities. And, and this contributed to that even more. If you look at all the people that, left places that were were shut down longer, like California and New York, moving to places like Texas, where I'm at, or Florida and other places that opened up faster, they were able to increase their productivity. They were able to get a job faster and, and, and go to school to get their kids in school faster. I mean, this is going to even widen that gap over, over time, if you consider those things, along with the other policies, I mean, I'm, I've talked a lot about, you know, um, the the no personal income tax, the sensible regulations, the less government spending, you know, those sort of policies in Texas compared to California, for example, of why more people want to be in Texas. But but I think this also contributed to it is that they they couldn't have a job, their job open. They couldn't start a new business. So why would you want to stay there when you can go to a lower cost of living place and start a business in Texas, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you saw a huge migration out of California into Texas, into Florida, into, mm -hmm. into you know, uh, places that were that were more more reasonable in their in their policies um, during the pandemic. And, you know, and I think it's it's striking, right? People vote with their feet. I keep getting I, I get all my friends are asking me, why did I stay in California? I mean, I have family in California, I have roots here. I want I, I love the place, but we made catastrophic mistakes. My kids didn't see the inside of our classroom for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if there's going to be other pandemics, can I really trust that the, that the California government won't just at a, at a whim shut the schools down again? I mean, I, you know, when when other places they are are not doing it and they're not seeing catastrophic effects that are predicted, I just don't. I just don't. Uh, how do you plan around that? How do you make a future around that? A lot of the the decisions, investments that we make in our lives, you know, opening a business, uh, getting a new job, getting married, whatever, having kids, uh, sending the school, that depends on some certainty about uh, about consistency in government action. And when the government can act in this very, very uh, inconsistent way, when the one, one hand saying investments in schools are important, and then at a, at a, at a whim, basically, at, at a whim, I mean, like at, at, at essentially based on, pan, on, on panicked overreaction, uh, shut it down, well, I have to plan for the future differently than with, think when I understand that that certainty that I used to have about, well, okay, the schools are always gonna be there for my kids. Well, it's not true. Yep.
Yep, that's right. Well, we've, we've covered a lot of ground here, Jay, and it's really been a pleasure talking with you. I'd like to leave us maybe on an optimistic note, if we could. Um, are, are there things that make you optimistic about the future to where, you know, we, we will be able to let people prosper, um, even though we have some of these challenges along the way? I, I, Vance, I have to say, I, I, um, I'm generally an optimistic person by nature. And, I, I, and of course, I share your commitment to wanting, wanting to provide uh, op- opportunities for prosper- prosperity for everybody. Um, but I have to say, I'm, I'm not... Like I've been watching what's been happening in the United States regarding the, the lessons learned from the pandemic, and I'm at this point convinced that if another uh, virus floats around, we will shut down again. Our, our the lessons we've learned are have been actually quite negative. Like they, we basically thought, like the, the the people that pushed the shutdowns, they look at the failure too, and but their reaction is, oh, we just didn't shut down hard enough, fast enough. Um, and I think that that is a that's I, I think that the uh, frankly I think the next presidential election, this should be a central issue. Uh, so the I guess, let me just leave with an optimistic thing. The optimistic thing is, I think it will be a central issue in the next election, right? You have candidates on in both parties that have made opposition to lockdown a central part of their their, their campaign pitch. It's it's quite, it's it, it, but, but at this point, I think it hangs in the balance. Where will Americans come down on the verdict of the last three years? And if Americans come down thinking that we, we did, we just didn't do enough. We didn't push hard enough. I don't. I don't actually don't see how a liberal democracy survives a pandemic, uh, a, a, essentially like a, a, a continual threat of pandemics, where government emergency action becomes the norm. The, the, on the flip side, I can see a future where we re, where we reject it. We we accept ethical constraints on public health uh, behavior, and we uh, make a recommitment to. Basic investments, uh, entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurial investments, but also investments in children, in the poor and the working class. I think that's that's possible, but I think we are at a crossroads now. And we have to decide. Yeah, no, I I agree with you. I'm also an optimistic person, but there's a there's a lot of pessimism out there. I mean, one thing we didn't even get into as much today would have been all of the increase in government spending and the new policies and the regulations and the the national debt you know that that soared during this period of time which is going to haunt us now and our kids and grandkids for the future along okay. with these other types of shutdown um, potential policies and so there's a lot that we still need to learn, Jay. I'm glad that you're on the front lines continuing to research this. I look forward to working with you in some capacity as we as we learn more about this and, and try to prevent this um, shutdowns from happening again. God bless you and your family, Jay, and thank you for being on the Let People Prosper show. Bless you too. Thank you, fans, for having me. Thank you so much, Jay. And for the audience, I hope you enjoyed our discussion today. Please leave us a five-star rating if you did and subscribe wherever you get your, wherever you get your podcast. Um, and until next time, let people prosper.